Rasselas, Prince of Abysnia, Chapter 5, The Prince Meditates His Escape. He now found it would be very difficult to effect that which was it very easy to suppose effected. When he looked round him, he saw himself confined by the bars of nature, which had never yet been broken, and by the gate through which none that had once passed it were ever able to return. He was now impatient as an eagle in a grate. He passed week after week in clambering the mountains to see if there was any aperture which the bushes might conceal, but found all the summits inaccessible by their prominence. The iron gate he despaired to open, for it was not only secured with all the power of art, but was always watched by successive sentinels, and was, by its position, exposed to the perpetual observation of all the inhabitants. He then examined the cavern through which the waters of the lake were discharged, and looking down at a time when the sun shone directly upon its mouth, he discovered it to be full of broken rocks, which, though they permitted the stream to flow through many narrow passages, would stop any body of solid bulk. He returned discouraged and dejected, but having now known the blessing of hope, resolved never to despair. In these fruitless searches he spent ten months. The time, however, passed cheerfully away. In the morning he rose with new hope, and in the evening applauded his own diligence, and in the night slept sound after his fatigue. He met a thousand amusements, which beguiled his labor and diversified his thoughts, he discerned the various instincts of animals and properties of plants, and found the place replete with wonders, of which he proposed to solace himself with the contemplation, if he should never be able to accomplish his flight. Rejoicing that his endeavors, though yet unsuccessful, had supplied him with a source of inexhaustible inquiry, but his original curiosity was not yet abated. He resolved to obtain some knowledge of the ways of men. He, his wish still continued, but his hope grew less. He ceased to survey any longer the walls of his prison, but spared to search by new toils for interstices which he knew could not be found, yet determined to keep his design always in view, and lay hold on any expedient that time should offer. Chapter 6. A Dissertation on the Art of Flying Among the artists that have been allured into the Happy Valley to labor for the accommodation and pleasure of its inhabitants was a man eminent for his knowledge of the mechanical powers who had contrived many engines, both of use and recreation. By a wheel, which the steam turned, he forced the water into a tower, Whence it was distributed to all the apartments of the palace. He erected a pavilion in the garden, around which he kept the air always cool by artificial showers. One of the groves appropriated to the ladies was ventilated by fans, to which the rivulets that ran through it gave constant motion, and instruments of soft music were placed at proper distances, of which some played by the impulse of the wind and some by the powers of the stream. This artist was sometimes visited by Rasselas, who was pleased with every kind of knowledge, imagining that the time would come when all his acquisitions should be of use to him in the open world. He came one day to amuse himself in his usual manner, and found the master busy in building a sailing chariot. He saw the design was practicable upon a level surface, and with expressions of great esteem solicited its completion. The workman was pleased to find himself so regarded by the prince and resolved to gain yet higher honors. Sir, said he, you have seen but a small part of what the mechanic sciences can perform. I have long been of the opinion that, instead of tardy conveyance of ships and chariots, man might use the swifter migration of wings, that the fields of air are open to knowledge, and that only ignorance and idleness need crawl upon the ground. This hint rekindled the prince's desire of passing the mountains. Having seen what the machinists had already performed, he was willing to fancy that he could do more, 
yet resolved to inquire further before he suffered hope to afflict him by disappointment. I am afraid, he said to the artist, that your imagination prevails over your skill, and that you now tell me rather what you wish than what you know. Every animal has his element assigned to him. The birds have the air, and man and beasts the earth. So, replied the mechanist, fishes have the water, in which yet beasts can swim by nature, and man by art. He that can swim needs not despair to fly. To swim is to fly in a grosser fluid, and to fly is to swim in a subtler. We are only proportioned to our power of resistance to the difficult, di different density of matter through which we are to pass. You will necessarily be upborne in by the air if you can renew any impulse upon it faster than the air can receive from the pressure. But the exercise of swimming, said the prince, is very laborious. The strongest limbs are soon wearied. I'm afraid the act of flying will be yet more violent, and wings will be of no great use unless we can fly further than we can swim. The labor of rising from the ground, said the artist, will be great, as we see it in the heavier domestic fowls. But as we mount higher, the earth's attraction and the body's gravity will gradually be diminished, till we shall arrive at a region where the man will float in the air without any tendency to fall. No care will then be necessary but to move forward, which the gentlest impulse will effect. You, sir, whose curiosity is so extensive, will easily conceive with what pleasure a philosopher, furnished with wings and hovering in the sky, would see the earth and all its inhabitants rolling beneath him and presenting to him successively by its diminual diurnal motion all the countries within the same parallel. How must it must amuse the pedant spectator to see the moving scene of land and ocean, cities and deserts, to survey with equal security the marts of trade and the fields of battle, mountains infested by barbarians, and fruitful regions gladdened by plenty and lulled by peace. How easily shall we then trace the Nile through all its passages, pass over to distant regions, and examine the face of nature from one extremity of the earth to the other? All this, said the prince, is much to be desired, but I am afraid that no man will be able to breathe in these regions of speculation and tranquility. I have been told that respiration is difficult upon lofty mountains, yet from these precipices, though so high as to produce great tenuity of the air, it is very easy to fall. Therefore, I suspect that from any height where life can be supported, there may be danger of too quick descent. Nothing, replied the artist will ever be attempted if all possible objections must first be overcome. If you will favor my project, I will try the first flight at my own hazard. I have considered the structure of all volant animals, and finding the folding continuity of the bat's wings most easily accommodated to the human form, upon this model I shall begin my task tomorrow, and in a year expect to tower into the air beyond the malice and pursuit of man. But I will work only on this condition, that the art shall not be divulged, and that you shall not require me to make wings for any but ourselves. Why, said Rasselas, should you envy others so great an advantage? All skill ought to be exerted for universal good. Every man has owed much to others, and ought to repay the kindness that he has received. If all men were virtuous, returned the artist. I should, with great alacrity, teach them all to fly. But what would be the security of the good if the bad could at pleasure invade them from the sky? Against an army sailing through the clouds, neither walls nor mountains nor seas could afford any security. A flight of northern savages might hover in the wind and light at once with an irresistible violence upon the capital of a fruitful region that was rolling under them. Even this valley, the retreat of princes, the abode of happiness, might be violated by the sudden descent of some of the naked nations that swarm on the coast of the southern sea. The prince promised secrecy, 
and waited for the performance not wholly hopeless of success. He visited the work from time to time, observed its progress, and remarked many ingenious contrivances to facilitate motion and unite levity with strength. The artist was every day more certain that he should leave vultures and eagles behind him, and contagion of his confidence seized upon the prince. In a year, the wings were finished, and on a morning appointed the maker furnished for a flight on a little promontory. He waved his pinions a while to gather air, and then leapt from his stand, and in an instant dropped into the lake. His wings, which were of no use in the air, sustained him in the water, and the prince drew him to land half dead, with terror and vexation. Chapter 7. The Prince Finds a Man of Learning The prince was not much afflicted by this disaster, having suffered himself to hope for happier event only because he had no other means of escape in view. He still persisted in his design to leave the Happy Valley by the first opportunity. His imagination was now at a stand. He had no prospect of entering into the world, and notwithstanding all his endeavors to support himself, discontent by degrees preyed upon him and began again to lose his thoughts in sadness when the rainy season, which in these countries is periodical, made it inconvenient to wander in the woods. The rain continued longer and with more violence than had ever been known. The clouds broke on the surrounding mountains and torrents streamed into the plain on every side till the cavern was too narrow to discharge the water. The lake overflowed its banks and all the levels of the valley was covered with the inundation. The eminence on which the palace was built and some other spots of rising ground were all that the eye could now discover. The herds and flocks left the pastures, both the wild beasts and tame retreated to the mountains. The inundation confined all the princes to domestic amusements, and the attention of Rasselas was particularly seized by a poem, which Imlac rehearsed upon the various conditions of humanity. He commanded the poet to attend to him in his apartment and recite the verses a second time. Then... Entering into familiar talk, he thought himself happy in having found a man who knew the world so well and could skillfully paint the scenes of life. He asked a thousand questions about things to which, though common to all other mortals, his confinement from childhood had kept him a stranger. The poet pitied his ignorance and loved his curiosity and entertained him from day to day with novelty and instruction so that the prince regretted the necessity of sleep and long till the morning should renew his pleasure. As they were sitting together, the prince commanded Imlac to relate his history, and to tell by what accident he was forced, or what motive induced, to choose his life in the Happy Valley. As he was going to begin his narrative, Rasselas was called to a concert, and obliged to restrain his curiosity till the evening. Chapter 8. The History of Imlac The close of the day is, in the regions of the torrid zone, the only season of diversion and entertainment, and it was therefore midnight before the music ceased and the princesses were tired. Rasselas then called for his companion, and required him to begin the story of his life. Sir, said Imlac, my history will not be long. The life that is devoted to knowledge passes silently away and is very little diversified by events. To talk in public, to think in solitude, to read and to hear, to inquire and answer inquiries is the business of a scholar. He wanders about the world without pomp or terror, and is neither known nor valued but by men like himself. I was born in the kingdom of Guama, at no great distance from the fountain of the Nile. My father was a wealthy merchant who traded between the inland countries of Africa and the ports of the Red Sea. He was honest, frugal, and diligent, but of mean sentiments and narrow comprehension. He desired only to be rich and to conceal his riches lest he should be spoiled by the governors of the province. Surely, said the prince, 
My father must be negligent of his charge if any man in his dominion dares to take what belongs to another. Does he not know that kings are accountable for injustice permitted as well as done? If I were the emperor, not the meanest of my subjects should be oppressed with impunity. My blood boils when I am told that a merchant does not enjoy his honest gains for fear of losing them by the rapacity of power. Name the governor who robbed the people that I may declare his crimes to the emperor. Sir, said Imlac, your ardor is natural effect of virtue animated by youth. The time will come when you will acquit your father, and perhaps hear with less impatience of the governor. Oppression is, in the Abyssinian dominions, neither frequent nor tolerated, but no form of government has yet discovered which, by which cre cruelty can be wholly prevented. Subordination supposes power on one part and the subjection on the other, and if power be in the hands of men, it will sometimes be abused. The vigilance of the supreme magistrate may do much, but much will still remain undone. He can never know all the crimes that are committed, and can seldom punish all that he knows. This, said the prince, I do not understand, but I had rather hear thee than dispute. Continue thy narration. My father, proceeded Imlac, originally intended I should have no other education than might qualify me for commerce, and discovering in me great strength of memory and quickness of apprehension, often declared his hope I should be some time the richest man in Abyssinia. Why, said the prince, did thy father desire to the increase of his wealth when it was already greater than he durst discover or enjoy. I am unwilling to doubt their veracity, yet inconsistencies can not both be true. Inconsistencies, answered Imlac, cannot be both right, but imputed to men they may both be true. Yet diversity is not inconsistency. My father might expect a time of greater security. However, some desire is necessary to keep life in motion, and he whose real wants are supplied must admit those of fancy. This, said the prince, I can in some measure conceive. I repent that I interrupted thee. With this hope, proceeded Imlac, he sent me to school. But when I had once found the delight of knowledge and felt the pleasure of intelligence and the pride of invention, I began silently to despise riches and determined to disappoint the purpose of my father, whose grossness of conception raised my pity. I was twenty years old before his tenderness would expose me to the fatigue of travel, in which time I had been instructed by successive masters in all the literature of my native country. As every hour taught me something new, I lived in a continual course of gratification, but as I advanced towards manhood, I lost much of the reverence with which I had been used to look on my instructors, because when the lessons were ended, I did not find them wiser or better than common men. At length, my father resolved to initiate me in commerce, and, opening one of his subterranean treasuries, counted out ten thousand pieces of gold. This, young man, said he, is the stock with which you must negotiate. I began with less than a fifth part, and you see how diligence and parsimony have increased it. This is your own to waste or improve. If you squander it by negligence or caprice, you must wait for my death before you will be rich. If in four years you double your stock, we will thenceforward let subordination cease and live together as friends and partners, for he shall always be equal with me who is equally skilled in the art of growing rich. We laid out our money upon camels, concealed in bales of cheap goods, and traveled to the shore of the Red Sea, when I cast my eye on the expanse of water my heart bounded like that of a prisoner escaped. I felt inextinguishable curiosity kindled in my mind, and resolved to snatch this opportunity of seeing the manners of other nations and of learning sciences unknown in Abyssinia. I remember what my father had obliged me to the improvement of my stock, not by promise, which I thought not to violate, but by penalty, which I was at liberty to incur. 
and therefore determined to gratify my predominant desire and, by drinking of the fountain of knowledge, to quench the thirst of curiosity. And I was supposed to trade without connection with my father. It was as easy for me to become acquainted with the master of a ship and procure a passage to some other country. I had no motive of choice to regulate my voyage. It was sufficient for me that, whenever I wandered, I should see a country which I had not seen before. I therefore entered a ship bound for Surat, having left a letter for my father declaring my intention. Chapter 9. The History of Imlac Continued When I first entered upon the world of waters and lost sight of land, I looked round about me with pleasing terror, thinking my soul enlarged by the boundless prospect, imagined that I could gaze around me forever without satiety. But in a short time I grew weary of looking on barren uniformity, where I could only see again what I had already seen. I then descended into the ship, and doubted for a while whether all my future pleasures would not end like this in disgust and disappointment. Yet surely, said I, the ocean and the land are very different. The only variety of water is rest and motion, but the earth has mountains and valleys, deserts and cities. It is inhabited by men of different customs and contrary opinions, and I may hope to find variety of in life, though I should miss it in nature. With this thought, I quieted my mind and amused myself during the voyage, sometimes learning from the sailors the art of navigation, which I never practiced, and sometimes by forming schemes for my conduct in different situations, in not one of which I have ever been placed. I was almost wary of my naval amusements when we landed safely at Surat. I secured my money and, purchasing some commodities for show, joined myself to a caravan that was passing into the inland country. My companions, for some reason or other, conjecturing that I was rich, and by my inquiries and admiration finding that I was ignorant, considered me as a novice whom they had the right to cheat, and who was to learn at the usual expense the art of fraud. They exposed me to the theft of servants and the exaction of officers and saw me plundered upon false pretenses without any advantage to themselves but that of rejoicing in the superiority of their own knowledge. Stop a moment, said the prince. Is there such depravity in man as he should injure another without benefit to himself? I can easily conceive that all are pleased with superiority, but your ignorance was merely accidental which, being neither your crime nor your folly, could afford them no reason to applaud themselves, and the knowledge which they had, and which you wanted, they might have effectually have shown by warning as betraying you. Pride, said Imlac, is seldom delicate. It will please itself with very mean advantages, and envy feels not its own happiness, but when it may be compared with the miseries of others. They were my enemies because they grieved to think me rich, and my oppressors because they delighted to find me weak. Proceed, said the prince. I doubt not of the facts which you relate, but imagine that you impute them to mistaken motives. In this company, said Imlac, I arrived at Agra, the capital of Indostan, the city in which the great mogul commonly resides. I applied myself to the language of the country, and in a few months was able to converse with the learned men, some of whom I found morose and reserved, and others easy and communicative. Some were unwilling to teach another what they had with difficulty learned themselves, and some showed the end of their studies was to gain the dignity of instructing. To the tutor of the young princes I recommended myself so much that I was presented to the emperor as a man of uncommon knowledge. The emperor asked me many questions concerning my country and my travels, and though I cannot now recollect anything that he uttered above the power of a common man, he dismissed me astonished at his wisdom and enamored of his goodness. My credit was now so high that the merchants with whom I had traveled applied to me for recommendations to the ladies of the court. I was surprised at their confidence of solicitation and gently reproached them with their practices on the road. They heard me with cold indifference and showed no tokens of shame or sorrow. They then urged their requests with the offer of a bribe, but what I would not do for kindness, 
I would not do for money, and refused them, not because they had injured me, but because I would not enable them to injure others. For I know they would have made use of my credit to cheat those who should buy their wares. Having resided at Agra till there was no more to be learned, I traveled into Persia, where I saw many remains of ancient magnificence and observed many new accommodations of life. The Persians are a nation eminently social, and their assemblies afford me daily opportunities of remarking characters and manners and of tracing human nature through all its variations. From Persia, I passed into Arabia, where I saw a nation at once pastoral and warlike, who live without any settled habitation, whose only wealth is their flocks and herds, yet carried on through all ages as a hereditary war with all mankind, though they neither covet nor envy their possessions. Chapter 10. In Lax History Continue. A Dissertation Upon Poetry. Wherever I went, I found that poetry was considered as the highest learning and regarded with a veneration somewhat approaching to that which man would pay to the angelic nature. And yet it fills me with wonder that in almost all countries the most ancient poets are considered the best, whether it be that every other kind of knowledge is an acquisition gradually attained and poetry is a gift conferred at once or that the first poet of every nation surprised them as a novelty and retained credit and retained cre the credit by consent which it received by accident at first, or whether, as the province of poetry is to describe nature and passion, which are always the same, the first writers took possession of the most striking objects for description, and the most probable occurrence for fiction, and left nothing to those that followed them but transcription of the same events and new combinations of the same thing. Whatever be the reason, it is commonly observed that the early writers are in possession of nature and their followers of art, that the first excel in strength and invention, and the later in elegance and refinement. I was desirous to add my name to this illustrious fraternity. I read all the poets of Persia and Arabia and was able to repeat by memory the volumes that are suspended in the mosque of Mecca. But I soon found that no man was ever great by imitation. My desire of excellence impelled me to transfer my attention to nature and to life. Nature was to be my subject and men to be my auditors. I could never describe what I had not seen. I could not hope to move those with delight or terror whose interests and opinions I did not understand. Being now resolved to be a poet, I saw everything with new purpose. My sphere of attention was suddenly magnified. No kind of knowledge was to be overlooked. I ranged mountains and deserts for images and resemblances, and pictured upon my mind every tree of the forest and flower of the valley. I observed with equal care the crags of rock and the pinnacles of the palace. Sometimes I wandered along the mazes of the rivulet, and sometimes watched the changes of the summer clouds. To a poet, nothing can be useless. Whatever is beautiful and whatever is dreadful must be familiar to his imagination. You must be conversant with all that is awfully vast or elegantly little. The plants of the garden, the animals of the wood, the minerals of the earth, the meteors of the sky, must all concur to store his mind with inexhaustible variety, for every idea is useful for the enforcement or decoration of moral or religious truth, and he who knows most will have the most power of diversifying his scenes and of gratifying his reader with remote illusions and unexpected instruction. All the appearances of nature I was therefore careful to study, and every country which I have surveyed has contributed something to my poetical powers. In so wide a survey, said the prince, you must surely have left much unobserved. I have lived till now within the circuit of these mountains, and yet cannot walk abroad without the sight of something which I had never beheld before, or never heeded. This business of a poet, said Imlac, is to examine not the individual but the species, to remark general properties and large appearances. He does not number the streaks of the tulip, or describe the different shades of the verdure of the forest. He is to exhibit in his portraits of nature such prominent and striking features as were called to the original every mind, 
and must neglect the minority discriminations, which one may have remarked and altogether have neglected for those characteristics which are alike obvious to vigilance and carelessness. But the knowledge of nature is only half the task of the poet. He must be acquainted likewise with all modes of life. His character requires that he estimate the happiness and misery of every condition, observe the power of all the passions in their combinations, and trace the changes of the human mind as they are modified by various institutions and accidental influences of climate or custom. From the sprightliness of infancy to the despondence of decrepitude, he must divest himself of the prejudices of his age or country. He must consider right and wrong in their abstracted and invariable state, and he must disregard present laws and opinions, and rise to the general and transcendental truths, which will always be the same. He must therefore content himself with the slow progress of his name, contend the applause of his own time, and commit his claims to the justice of posterity. He must write as interpreter of nature and legislator of mankind, and consider himself as presiding over the thoughts and manners of future generations as a being superior to time and place. His labor is not yet at an end. He must know many languages and many sciences, and that his style might be worthy of his thoughts must be incessant practice familiarized to himself every delicacy of speech and grace of harmony. Chapter 11. In life's narrative, continued, a hint of pilgrimage. Imlac now felt the enthusiastic fit, and was proceeding to aggrandize his own profession when the prince cried out, Enough! Thou hast convinced me that no human being can ever be a poet. Proceed with thy narration. To be a poet, said Imlac, is very difficult indeed. So difficult, returned the prince, that I will at present hear no more of his labors. Tell me whither thou went when you had seen Persia. From Persia, said the poet, I traveled through Syria and for three years resided in Palestine, where I conversed with great numbers of the northern and western nations of Europe. The nations which are now in possession of all power and all knowledge, whose armies are irresistible and whose fleets command the remotest parts of the globe. When I compared these men with the natives of our own kingdom and those that surround us, they appeared almost another order of beings. In their countries, it is difficult to wish for anything that might not be obtained. A thousand arts, of which we have never heard, are continually laboring for their convenience and pleasure, and whatever their own climate has denied them is supplied by their commerce. By what means, said the prince, are Europeans thus powerful? Or why, since they can so easily visit Asia and Africa for trade or conquest, cannot the Asiatics and Africans invade their coasts, plant colonies in their ports, and give laws to their natural princes? The same wind that carries them back would bring us thither. They are more powerful, sir, than we, answered Imlac, because they are wiser. Knowledge will always predominate over ignorance as man governs the other animals. By why their knowledge is more than ours, I know not what reason can be given but the unsearchable will of the Supreme Being. When, said the prince with a sigh, shall I be able to visit Palestine and mingle with this mighty confluence of nations? Till that happy moment shall arrive, let me fill up the time with such representations as thou canst give me. I am not ignorant of the motive that assembles such number, numbers in that place, but consider it as a center of wisdom and piety to which the best and wisest men of every land must be continually resorting. There are some nations, said Imlac, that send few visitants to Palestine, for many numerous and learned sects in Europe concur to censure pilgrimage as superstitious, or to write it as ridiculous. You know, said the prince, how little my life has made me acquainted with the diversity of opinions. It will be too long to hear the arguments on both sides, you that have considered them. Tell me the result. Pilgrimage, said Imlac, like many other acts of piety, must be reasonable or superstitious, 
according to the principles on which it is performed. Long journeys in search of truth are not commanded. Truth, such as is necessary to the regulation of life, is always found where it is honestly sought. Change of place is no natural cause to the increase of piety, for it inevitably produces dissipation of the mind. Yet, since men go every day to view the fields where great actions have been performed, and return with stronger impressions of the event, curiosity of the same kind might naturally dispose us to view that country where our religion had its beginning, and I believe no man surveys those awful scenes without some confirmation of holy resolutions. That the Supreme Being may be more easily propitiated in one place than another is the dream of idle superstition, but that some places may operate on our own minds in an uncommon manner is an opinion which hourly experience will justify. He who supposes that his vices may be more successfully combated in Palestine will perhaps find himself mistaken. Yet he may go thither without folly. He who thinks they will be more freely pardoned dishonors at once his reason and religion. These, said the prince, are European distinctions. I will consider them another time. What have you found to be the effect of knowledge? Are those nations happier than we? There is so much infelicity, said the poet, in the world that scarce any man has leisure from his own distress to estimate the comparative happiness of others. Knowledge is certainly one of the means of pleasure, and is confessed by the natural desire which every mind feels increasing its ideas. Ignorance is merely privation, by which nothing can be produced. It is a vacuity in which the soul sits motionless and torpid for want of attraction, and without knowing why, we always rejoice when we learn, and grieve when we forget. I am therefore inclined to conclude that if nothing counteracts the natural consequence of learning, we grow more happy as our minds take a wider range. In enumerating the particular comforts of life, we, find, we shall find many advantages on the side of the Europeans. They cure wounds and diseases with which we languish in Paris. We suffer inclemencies of weather which they can obviate. They have engines for the dispatch of many laborious works which we must perform by manual industry. There is such communication between distant places that one friend can hardly be said to be absent from another. Their policy removes all public inconvenience. They have roads cut through the mountains and bridges laid over their rivers. And if we descend to the privacies of life, their habitations are more commodious and their positions are more secure. They are surely happy, said the prince, who have all these conveniences of which I envy none so much of the facility with which separated friends interchange their thoughts. The Europeans, answered Imlac, are less unhappy than we, but they are not happy. Human life is everywhere a state in which so much is to be endured and little to be enjoyed.